Good morning, church. Levine, that's my man. I, told him, I, told, I saw him earlier when I saw that, and I go, Levine, you're a star. Your star is born. Only reason I'm, no, nah, not the only reason, but one of the reasons I like to say he's my man. You know, he mentioned me twice in that. They just said, Pastor Brad's preaching, but then, but my heart is the body ministries and being the hands and feet of Jesus. That statement, being the hands and feet of Jesus, is what our life is really all about. It's what we really need to be talking about. And that's kind of, we're going to touch on that today. We're going to go about it in a roundabout way. But um, I'm going to have a lot of questions today. And I'm hopefully by the end of the service, you'll have answers for those questions for yourself. And I can guarantee you that no matter how many people's here, it'll be that many different answers. And you're thinking, how does that happen? That's just the way the word of God works. Well, we've had a pretty great Great big buildup of services up until today. We just got through doing two weeks of basically Easter, the Passover. And I don't know if you've been here for every single one of those. If you were here for uh, Palm Sunday, if you were here for Good Friday, uh, the anointed Good Friday service. And, of course, last week we learned a lot about how we're viewed and what we're looked at, how Jesus was viewed and how things fall off. But I don't know about you guys, but when, we're, when you get up on that, I call it the mountaintop, and you're on that high mountaintop and you're just excited, it's been an exciting week. How many of you guys have felt that buildup over the last couple of weeks and you feel like it's been an exciting week? Have you really been excited? And has Christ really been working in your life? But there's two things that happen when you really get excited and you really get on that mountaintop and you just, things are just like, yeah, yes, this is happening. You know what? Satan gets busy at that time. So the other question I would ask is how many of you guys got that build up, but then over this last week, it's like, man, you just feel like you're just being beat up instead of build up. It's like, knock me down, kick me around, hurt me up. And you just feel like, what the world's going on here? Well, I'm going to tell you, say hallelujah, Jesus, if that starts to happen, because you know what? You're doing something right, because Satan don't even get busy until you start getting excited. I can hear it. Somebody's in there going, I heard some amens, thank you, but I can tell you right now, there's somebody sitting there, you don't know what I go through. Satan attacks me all the time. I'm going to tell you right now, Satan don't attack you all the time. You, your problem. That's right. You are your problem. Satan don't have to work too hard for most of the world and most of us because we create our own issues. Because we're going to do it our way. We've been raised to do it our way. We've been raised to look for the happiness in life. So, with that being said, the first question I got, which is also the title of my sermon, are you having a breakthrough or a breakdown? We've been led up. We've been brought up. We've been lifted up. Are you having a breakthrough or you've been having a breakdown? Well, let me explain something about a breakdown, especially when it comes to Christ. Usually when we're having a breakdown, one of the reasons we might, you might be having a breakdown is because you're stuck in the past and you're not even ready for the future, which is right here in front of you. Churches have that problem right now. And you know what? When I say churches, I mean the people because we are the church, right? We've heard that in the last few sermons. A lot of us have a hard time dealing with the new stuff. And I'm raising my hand because I'm one of those. And I know my wife didn't let me cut my hair so you guys can see that I'm old and got gray hair. And a lot of us that have that old gray hair, I like to call it wisdom or whatever you want to call it. We have a hard time with the changes of today's society. Young people just computer it. Boom, they got it right now. But the rest of us, we got to go pull out a book and look it up. We write things down on a piece of paper with ink that don't even work in our pens. And then we got to go find a pen. And by the time we find the pen, we already forgot what we're supposed to write down. Is that sound familiar? Yeah, some of you are laughing at that, but that's our life. It's the future. It's change. Even in the church today, there's change going on. We're not just singing hymns, and it's not just a piano up there, which I grew up in. We got drums. We got sound boards and sound systems. We got loud music, which some of us old folks complain about all the time. But that's okay. I don't have a hearing aid. I can't turn it down. So eventually, we'll get it down to where we can worship in unity, age or otherwise. But in the meantime, 
God's in control. That second song we sang today, that new song that we sang today, wow, that is so awesome. That is so awesome because God will never fail you. God will never fail you. Another way that we have a breakdown, and this is, I want you to listen to this. Think about what I'm saying to you. What you wrote off. How many of you guys have written something off in your life? You had a goal in life. You realized that I was raised for this. I went to school for this. I got an education for that. I'm moving in this direction or that direction, and it's just not happening. You have a goal in life, and eventually you realize I I'm getting older or this isn't going, and I'm tired of fighting here, and I'm tired of it's being such a struggle, and it's not working. So you just write it off, and you let it go. But what you write off, God calls to use. God will use those things in your life. If God put it in your life, don't ever write it off. If God gives you direction, don't ever veer off in another area because it's just not working out the way you want to. God has a reason for that, and he has a use for that, and he will never let you go out on your own. Do you have goals in your life? Because God already has proclaimed he has a plan for your life. There's a contrast here. You notice I started that statement by saying, asking, do you have goals for your life? But are your goals the same goals as God's goals? Or have you even bothered to ask him? Maybe you're having a breakdown because you don't ever ask him what his goals are for your life. But God has already has a plan for your life. All you have to do is tune in to him and not all your buddies and all your friends and everybody else in the world and asking them what those goals are. He's given it to you your whole life. He's given you visions. He's given you direction. He's given you different things of that nature so that you can start to attain this and move towards that. He's given you the stuff that you're throwing away that he's going to use and he sees as valuable and gold and you're just trashing it because it just didn't work. Let's start over. Let's try this. Let's try that. Unfortunately, in today's society, marriage is one of those things that gets thrown aside. Let's try this and try that. People give up. But God never said it would be easy. Actually, that's one of the hardest things to do is sustain a long, long marriage. But for you young people in there, we got people like old Dale sitting back there with his wife. I ain't, don't even have a clue how many years, but I know it's been a lot of years they've been married. My wife and I have been married for over 34 years. I can tell you right now, it ain't easy. But she still puts up with me. <laughs> sometimes I wonder why, because sometimes I don't even put up with myself. <laughs> but God does. But God don't throw none of us to the side. We can't just abandon his plan because it doesn't line up with our plan. Matter of fact, maybe you need to abandon your plan pick up his plan and watch how things work. But you know what? In Jeremiah 29, 11, everybody probably has heard this scripture and I'm going to read it for you, but God tells us very clearly and it reads like this, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, says the Lord. I have plans for you, he says, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and the future. So if you think that you ain't got no future, things aren't happening, and you just don't see that future coming your way, maybe you need to look at the word of God, look up Jeremiah, and just live off of that. Because he has a plan for you. But this is what really stands out. Let's go back to that a minute. It says, I have plans for you. Who's speaking here? God. He says, I, this is the creator of all the earth. This is a God that started this wind that blew all your hair around when you was coming in here today. He's in control of that. He blows it and he stops it. If he can control that, you think he can control the plans he has for you? You think he can, you think he can literally have you standing right here at the base of this mountain on one day, sweating like a pig, so hot you're going to pull off your clothes and jump into somebody's swimming pool, even if you know them or don't know them, then the very next day, put snow on those mountaintops. But he's got a plan for you. He's thinking about you as an individual. I can sit here right now and go through this sanctuary, and I can't tell you half the names in here. 
and I see you every week. Shame on me. God knows your name, and he knows the plan he has for you, and he's willing to reach down and make that plan happen, but it's got to be his. It ain't got to be yours. You need to start syncing it up. You know, the other thing that we hear a lot, <laughs> I've heard this. When I first learned this scripture, you know, I didn't really learn this scripture from reading the Bible. I learned it from hearing everybody quote it. And usually when somebody's in trouble, and I, I, I just, these people that like to just throw scriptures out there in their, in their life, and then the things are going tough, and you see somebody, and, I, and I'm just, I'm relating a true story to you right now. And I remember seeing this one lady that's having a deal, and she throws out, well, I, God has a plan for you. I know the plans he has, and he has a plan to prosper me. And I'm going to be making it. I'm going to get that car that I wanted because he has a plan to prosper me. And then later on says, in Jeremiah, God said he has a plan to prosper me. I've heard preachers from the pulpit preach a whole sermon on just that. He has plans to prosper me. Prosperity. We all want prosperity. God don't want us to be broken, broken down. But I want to tell you right now, what he's talking about prosperity here has absolutely nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with greenbacks or dead presidents that's on those greenbacks. It has every bit to do with spiritual prosperity, growth in God. You want to be rich? You really want to be wealthy? You Just get into the word of God. Seek up your life with God's life. Spiritually, he will lift you up and you will be so rich. That when you got a dollar, it seems like a hundred. It works every single time. He don't care if you ain't got no money. He cares if you care for him. If you're willing to give your time and your life for him. So it's not about physical, worldly prosperity. So what I'm getting at is try not to take out of context which works into your plan. God's word because it ain't going to fit. Take his plan put it into your life and it'll fit like a glove. And then he can look at you when it comes time for judgment and says if it don't fit you must have quit. I had to throw that in there. I had to throw that in there. I know it's corny. Get rid of that. Anyway you know me I'm throwing all kinds of crazy stuff and God slaps me around and says get back on the topic. Well, I'm going to go through a few of the steps, a few things that are very important that I'm, that I'm going to hopefully help you guys with, which helped me. And so I'll feel like I, I'm obligated to share on uh, how to make sure that I sync up my plans with God's plans so that I can have breakthrough instead of a breakdown. So that I don't start freaking out when things don't happen. When I got to pay the rent and the money hasn't come in yet. Or when I got this coming on you. Like, oh, 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 I'm having this problem. Or when I get cut off on the freeway and I'm ready to run that guy down and give him a couple of those fingers that's on your hand that needs to be cut off. He has a way so that you don't have that breakdown. Because that's exactly what it is. And you can have a breakthrough. Just step back. Take your foot off that gas pedal. Let that car go on through. As long as they didn't hit you, if they hit you, then you exchange information and you tell them, God bless you. Don't scream at them when you get over there after they hit you. That's a breakthrough, not a breakdown, because God's in control of that moment. Let him start to control you. And the very first way that can happen is prayer. It's prayer. Now we start thinking about prayer, and it's like, okay, I'm thinking about prayer. And uh, I know. Well, I'm going to tell you something right now. Prayer is one of the most important things that we can do. It moves. Angels dance in heaven when we pray. But I'm also going to tell you something. You know what prayer really is? It's just talking to Jesus. It's just talking to God. It's a conversation. And I do it daily. You know, the scripture says pray without ceasing. First time I ever heard that, I go, you got to be giving give me crap. That's crazy. I got things I got to do. I got my mind focused here and focused there. Pray without ceasing. Well, you know what that really means? In every situation, in every minute of your day, God's in control of your life. And if you pray to him, which is just talking to him, and it takes that quick. God, is, am, I in, am I in my, in your perfect will at this? Is my, is my attitude right right now? Is my thought process right right now? 
Am I going in the direction you want me to go in right now? Am I going over here to do this for your purposes or do I have my attitude going on here? That's, that's second by second, minute by minute in our lives. Now, you don't have to walk around and start saying, walking down the street, especially if you're in Hollywood because they're really going to say you're crazy. Walking down the street, hey, God, am I in your wheel over here? I see a guy here. Am I in your wheel over here, God? Yeah, no, I'm not asking you to just be a crazy loco out there doing that stuff. But you can walk down the street and you can come across someone and you can smile at that person and say, God, is that, my, is that smile in your good image? Instead of, Because that's the way people meet each other in California. That's the way it happens. I'm from Tennessee. I'm a country boy. Back in the sticks, in the hills, and smoky mountains. And when I moved to California, I was 19 years old. I got a job at Kaiser in Hollywood. And I remember my first weekend and going out, and when I had my lunch break, I'd go down on, 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 um, on uh, Sunset Boulevard, and people walking all over the place. In my town, even the people you don't like, you still spoke to them because you was taught that. I remember walking down the street, and I'm hi. Hi, people look, doing all that stuff. Then I had a guy one day, I go, hey, how you doing? He goes, why are you speaking to me? Why are you speaking to me? Don't you speak to me? And I go, I just wanted to say hi. I couldn't figure it out. Now my buddy said, you don't do that in California. I go, but I'm supposed to. My mama going to kill me if I go home and she find out I'm not speaking to people. And I, I'm sorry, I don't like that belt. <laughs> I could be 19. She still busts my behind if I ain't treating right. But it's the wrath of God that's teaching us. Just be kind to people in whatever way you need to be kind to people. And check in with him. It's just a matter of prayer. So what role does prayer play in your life? What role does prayer play in your life? Is it the steering wheel or is it the spare tire? Come on. You guys, you guys showed up in a car today. And that steering wheel, if, it don't, if it's not guiding the direction you go, you don't get here. So is prayer what's directing you? Is it the guide? Is it steering you in the direction you need to go? Is it the steering wheels or the spare tire? You know what the spare tire is for. You never look at it. You never see it. You don't even know if it's out there until you're in trouble and something happens and you go, oh, i got to get out of this position. And you open up the trunk and it's not even there either. It's like, wow! Is that your prayer life? As soon as things go wrong, God, please help me, Lord. I'm going to pray to you. Oh, I'll even get on my knees. Oh, it hurts my knees. I'll stand up, oh, God. Oh. Because if that's your prayer life, is that the condition of your prayer life, you need to get that out and get it in his place. Make it your steering wheel. That's the beginning. Make it your steering wheel, the steering wheel, not the spare tire. Another thing is reading God's word. There's some guilt trip that goes on that we've been taught through our lives about reading God's word. You know, the whole, well, if you don't read his word every single day, you're just disappointing God and it's bad and you're going to sin and you're a sinner because you're not reading his word every single day. Why not read enough of his word, learn enough of his word to where it's right here? Because in his word, he says, it's in your heart and I'll give it to you when you need it through the Holy Spirit who lives within you. That doesn't mean abandon your Bible and put it to the side. That means take time to meditate on it. And when you do read it, make it worthwhile. And if you miss two or three days, don't go on a guilt trip. It's easy. A lot of people give up on reading their Bibles because they don't fall into the quote unquote normal of reading it every single day. They get guilty because they miss three days. So what do they do? They just say, oh, well, forget it. I'll never catch up. I'm not going to read it again. No, no, no. Read his word. If you read it once a month, read it and learn from it as you read it once a month. Because if you learn from it, what happens is it gets so exciting and the Holy Spirit starts working you, then you want to read it the next time, at least to finish that story, because something's exciting about that story if you take time to read it and not just go across the words of the book so fast that you can say, oh, I read through the whole Bible in a year. It's great if you can do that, but if you don't do that, it's okay too. You know what? God, Jesus will re meet you at those pearly gates just as well as he will the guy that read it three times in a year and you only read half of it or a few quotes. Any part that you give him and you get into the word, consider this. Why is it that you want to read the word? Because it provides encouragement and it also provides direction. In James chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, 
it says this. It says, consider it pure joy. I'm going to finish it. Consider it pure joy. Ha! <laughs> Jesus, oh yeah. Consider it pure joy when you face trials. What you talking about, Brad? I ain't talking about nothing. That's the word of God talking over here. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. He covered everybody on that one. And he said many kinds. That way it's not all the same trials. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. Amen. Give God a hand. I know we all like that when we persevere, we don't, we don't, we don't like nothing. We get everything. You just got to remember what it takes to become for that perseverance. That's talking about trials, tribulations, problems. God wants to make us mature and complete so that we can stand firm in our problems and move forward in him. So, instead of complaining, we should see God's plan as opportunities for growth. So when you start going through these trials, you start having problems, when you're starting to have the breakdown, reach out for him so he can help you break through and recognize for the next time that you run into anything similar to that, you got it handled. You can look back at that and say, got it. It's done. You look up at God and say, favor. You know what I mean? That's the way he takes care of you. Get into his word. You know what? God won't leave you alone. He will never leave you alone. When you're going through that, he won't leave you alone with your problems. He stays close to help you go through it. Sometimes it might not feel like he's close, but I'm telling you, the only reason he ain't close is because you're pushing him aside. Remember how you got your plans and you're going to handle this situation you're in? When you start deciding you're going to handle this situation in, you know what God does? He says, I'll let you, but I'm going to stand right here because you're getting ready to fall. Oh, you want to move farther away? I'll get a little closer because you're going to fall. He goes, yeah, you're on the edge of that pulpit now. You're going to fall. Ba-doom! Then he goes, come on up, my child. Let's brush you off a little bit. And then we'll move on. He never is that far away. And if you think he's that far away, then you need to take a look in the mirror. Because you're the problem, not him. Another way of doing that is follow the commands God puts on your heart. You notice I said follow the commands that God puts on your heart. God puts on your heart. I guarantee you that if you really think about it and take the time to look at it, there are things in your life, things that God asks you to do, and he's put it on your heart to do, but come up with like 16 different excuses. Well, I don't know who to contact. I don't know which way to go. I don't know where to go. What are they going to think? If I'm going to do this, or if I'm going to do that, even something as simple as if I should, if I should go help the homeless or go down there and let me tell you something, God, even, even, you know, I told you God don't care about no money. He, he don't care if you give these people money. If you're, if you're really concerned about the homeless in this community, why don't you go talk to them? I've spent years talking to them. And I've met some of the most educated, smartest people in my life that are homeless on the streets, looking and smelling like scum. But the only, first way, the only way you're, you're going to be able to do that when God puts it on your heart is you're going to have to not judge them. And you're going to have to recognize that they're his children and he loves them as much as he loves you. We're a family. We're in God's family. But that doesn't mean that everybody out here has got to run and have to talk to them because that might not be what God puts on your heart. And if you don't put it on your heart, don't do it. He might put something else on your heart. And I'm going to tell you right now, when you say I want to do something, that means you ain't going to do it. I'm telling you right now, when you say you want to do something, that means you ain't going to do it. Because if we do what we want to do, but when we talk about what we want to do, we usually don't end up doing it, especially if it's something that's Trial, a trial, a try, a trying for us to do, or it's not that easy. But if God put it on your heart, then you can say, 
I look forward to doing this because I want to please my father. Ask him. He'll tell you what he wants you to do. I know I talk to people and they all the time and they say, Pastor Brad, I'm praying and I'm praying. I've been praying and God just don't tell me what he wants me to do. Yeah, he does. You just don't want to hear what he got to say. I'm serious. He doesn't always speak right now and he doesn't always scream at you from a burning bush. Or he doesn't always throw a lightning rod down and smack your brother's head and wake you up and say, I'm talking to you. You don't hear this audible voice, but he's telling you something, and it's, 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 it's there. It's almost like a little gnat. It's almost in your way. Get it, get it off of me. That's how much it can be annoying, and you just don't want to recognize it. God's he's going to be annoying to you every once in a while because he's trying to get your attention. Listen to what he's got to say. When he calls you to do something that's just too big, you know it's too big, and you know, I can't figure this out, God. There's no way I'm going to do this. Let me tell you how you make sure that you act on what his commands are for you. You notice I said his commands? I didn't say he says, if you feel like it, you do this. When God tells you to do something, it's a command, and when he gives you a command, you need to make sure that you follow that command and do that. So that means you have to really act, get into word with him and talk to him and get deep into it. But How? One of the best things you can do is rely on past experiences. You remember earlier, I kind of mentioned where you, if you have a problem and then you, God gets you through it, next time you have something similar, you're able to just move right past it because you have that confidence. Well, I'm going to give you one. We've all heard of David. There's a guy by the name of David in the Bible, huh? Little boy. And when you think of David, you think of Goliath. Yeah, we think of Goliath. How little David was able to take out this big giant with a slingshot and a rock. Well, let me tell you something. Past experiences give you courage for the, to be able to move forward in your future movements. Before David met Goliath, he met a lion and he met a bear, and he killed them both. Little old David, come on now. He killed them both. Now he's on this giant. But tell me, let me tell you something. That bear got claws way bigger than Goliath did. But he also knew that he had to be connected with somebody else. And you know who he was connected with? God. And he knew right up from the front that that rock ain't going to do nothing to that dude because he's big. He knew back with the bear and the lion that he wasn't going to be able to do it. But he knew God could. And he called it out. Goliath, I don't care how big you are. You can't touch me because I got God in my back pocket. And he's going to move to the front pocket. And he's going to kick your behind with this little little rock. And he did it. Rely on past experiences to give you the courage. And there's a past experience where God is in control. You allowed him to do it his way, not your way. You will be successful, guaranteed. Step into that again when you're going through these hard times, when you're having a breakdown. Watch what he does. Also, there's also something that's very important that I think we kind of take too lightly church days and it's called seeking godly community what I'm talking about is church like the building that we're in now when you guys come through that door you need to be smiling because we're having a party we're having fun I get to see people that I don't often get to see I only see them maybe once a week but you get an opportunity to see them I was talking to the group this morning and I told them you know the only reason I even come to church and I'm, we are the church but the only reason I even come to this building It's only one reason that I come to this building, to see you guys, to see you guys. Somebody's out there saying, this ain't a social hall. This ain't a social place. We're here to worship God. I'm here to worship God, too. But I can worship God at home, too. But I don't get to meet with you guys. I don't get to commune with you guys, get to know you guys, get to celebrate with you guys. Sunday morning is a celebration. We should be dancing in aisles around here because of what God has done for us every minute of our life up to this point, beyond this point, and at this time. It's a time of celebration because we're the church. We come here to just give him the glory united as a group. And we need to act like we want to give him joy united as a group, get to know each other, spend some time with each other. Encourage each other because when you have a group like this, we're a godly family. We create encouragement so that we can get through the rest of the week. And if you know each other and you get involved in some community groups, you get to call people up during the week and say, hey, this is going on, that's going on, this is going on, and I I need your help. You can do that, but 
it's also a good way of accountability. When you start going whack and getting off and you're not getting in the right place you need to be with God, hopefully you got a friend that's going to say, hey, brother, come here a minute. Your attitude is just messed up. And if we're calling each other's friends, I can be straight with you. You need to seek God and let's pray about it, brother. We'll get you through that. And, of course, the last thing is to obey God's truth. And I talked about it a minute ago, asking God on a daily basis. Let me tell you this. If you live your life according to God's plan, you will 100% always encounter a breakthrough. 100% a breakthrough. We need to obey the truth that God has in his word, and we need to obey him. And I guarantee you, when you start lining your plans up with God's plans, or even better, take your plans, throw them out the window, put God's plans in there, and I guarantee you, as you start on that journey, for some reason, somehow they meet. Because they were his plans to start with. You just thought you had thought that up. You didn't think up nothing. He gave it to you. And he's gracious enough to let you think that, or let you think that it's yours or want to keep it as yours. But there will come a time where you have to realize it's all his. And he will help carry you through that. I laid out five specific things that God's plan for your life for breakthrough. And, I, if, and right now, as I'm getting ready to close, some of you guys take notes. And if you take notes, it's going to be up on the board here. If you need to write it down, take a screenshot to kind of remember these, these five different things. Do whatever you need to do. If you don't. I'm not a note taker, so I probably wouldn't have taken the notes anyway. Whatever it takes to make you recognize, if you really want to be in God's plan and you want to break through in your life, instead of breaking down every time something goes haywire, goes sideways on you, refer back to this. And when you do that, you will see your life change, you will see your community change, and we will see the world change. Because I'm telling you right now, there's more of us than it is them out there creating havoc. But it doesn't have to be more of us because God controls it all. And God wants nothing but good for the rest of all of us and the whole world. And he wants to fill this place up with brothers and sisters who love each other. Because of one thing we have in common and the only thing we need to have in common which is Jesus Christ. Can I pray with you guys? Heavenly Father, I thank you for each and every person here. I thank you for each and every person online, God. And I just ask that you use this message to reach those people. I ask that you use this opportunity for them to recalculate, recalibrate, and rethink their life with you and start to utilize the simple tip of just praying to you, which means communicating with you on a minute-by-minute -minute basis instead of a monthly-by-monthly -monthly basis or trouble-to-trouble -trouble basis. God, we look forward to being your warriors in the future, and we love calling you our Father. We love you and praise you, give you all the glory in Jesus' precious and holy name. And let us all say,